All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, we have a research webinar focused on our chemical engineering department. My name is Emily DeRosa. I'm a recruiting specialist in the Graduate School of Engineering, and I am joined today by Professor Francisco Hung, who will be going ahead and uh, providing the bulk of the presentation, the chemical engineering research. Uh, before we get started with the research portion of the webinar, I'm going to share my screen quickly and just go over an, uh, a couple brief slides, which are an overview of our Graduate School of Engineering here at Northeastern. So I will go ahead and share my screen. All right, before I dive into um, the bulk of my slides, I just want to go ahead and share this slide quickly right here. Uh, this is our code of conduct for all webinars that we host here in the Graduate School of Engineering. Um, we ask for a respectful environment during these webinars. We do encourage questions to be asked. We do have the Q&A feature enabled, and we will host a Q&A session um, at the end of this webinar for any questions that you have for Professor Hung um, or any admissions related questions that you may have. Um, so we just ask for a respectful environment and for everyone to follow our code of conduct as we dive into this webinar. And we thank you all for your attendance and for your participation. And now I'll go ahead and share just a couple of slides. One second, here we go. And we'll just make these larger. All right, can everyone see that okay? Awesome. All right. So I will start out with just a brief overview of Northeastern University as a whole. We are rated uh, top 44 R1 research and experiential university. Uh, we are ranked number one in cooperative education, which uh, many of you might be familiar with. Uh, our co-op education at Northeastern really stands in the forefront. It's something that we're really proud of, um, and our experiential learning is such a value to our students, both undergraduate and, of course, our graduate students. Uh, Northeastern is made up of nine colleges and schools, and that totals to over 40,000 students. Uh, Northeastern offers degree all the way up to the doctorate level. We have $230 million in external research awards. Um, and as you'll see uh, by the content of this webinar today, research really is at the forefront of what we're doing, um, especially here in the Graduate School of Engineering. We're so proud of all the research that's being done, um, and it's really some amazing stuff. Um, we have our main campus located in Boston, Massachusetts, where uh, we are joining you from today, but we also do have a global campus network. Northeastern has a presence um, over the United States, as well as two campuses or a couple campuses abroad now. And this photo here uh, really just kind of encompasses our global campus network. You can see um, we have many locations and uh, our newest being our Miami, Florida location. Um, we have our uh, Oakland location, which is also very new out in California, and we're continuing to expand uh, lots of programs, including graduate engineering programs across these global campuses. Um, and something that we have in common with all of our campuses is our focus on um, education, research, and experiential learning. Um, here is a nice breakdown of the College of Engineering. You can see our total student body is just over 10,000 students. Um, just about 3,760 of those are undergrads. And our graduate population is almost double that at 6,260. Um, we offer PhD, master's, and bachelor's degrees within the College of Engineering. And that totals to over 102 academic degrees, certificates, and minors. Um, here you can see a breakdown of our faculty members, our full-time faculty research. Um, we also have $92.5 million in external research awards solely within the Graduate School of Engineering. Um, and Northeastern was ranked number 33 in engineering graduate school programs. 
Here you can see a breakdown of the different departments that we have within the College uh, of Engineering. We have our disciplinary programs such as bioengineering, chemical engineering, mechanical and industrial engineering, civil and environmental engineering, electrical and computer engineering. And then our sixth department is our multidisciplinary department, which includes uh, many different aspects of engineering, including the IT areas um, and gaining an education across multiple sectors of the engineering fields. Here's another breakdown of uh, just how many academic programs that we do offer, and also a breakdown of what graduate programs we offer within our global campuses. Um, you can see here that we have um, engineering programs launched uh, at our global campuses, as well as um, some abroad. And this is a brief overview of the cooperative education that I mentioned earlier. Northeastern is known for this, ranked number one in the US. Um, this allows our students to gain real world experience as part of their curriculum. Um, and co op is available to both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, each year, about 2,897 2, students um, are hired from co ops, and we have nearly 2,200 co op employer partners that we work with um, to ensure our students are getting these real world experiences. They're able to put this on their resume um, and they're able to build this as part of their network for post graduation. Again, as was mentioned earlier, we are an R1 research institution with $92.5 million in external awards in the Graduate School of Engineering. Um, we have 18 multidisciplinary research centers and institutes that are funded by eight federal agencies. Um, research really is, again, at the forefront of what's happening here at Northeastern. Um, we are doing transformative research here that is, um, you know, addressing global challenges for social impact. And this here is just an overview of those 18, 18 research centers and institutes that we have here at Northeastern. This slide here is uh, just an overview of our faculty. As you can see, our faculty are extremely accomplished. We have over 115 Young Investigator Awards, 67 NSF Career Awards, over 95 Professional Society Fellowships, and three NAE memberships within our College of Engineering faculty, which is so impressive. This here is, uh, you know, just a snippet of our facilities that we have here at Northeastern. Um, the photo to the left-hand side is our ISEC building, where a lot of our engineering labs are located. That's a brand new state-of-the-art facility that was built on our Boston campus, and we are continuing to expand these facilities um, and grow both on our Boston campus and our global campuses as well. And that is all, <clears throat> excuse me, that I have for our engineering overview. Um, I'm so honored to pass the torch over to Professor Hung to go ahead and dive into the bulk of the presentation and focus on our chemical engineering research. So thanks so much for joining today, Professor Hung. I will pass it over to you. All right. Thank you. Let me just go ahead and deal with the technology. I always have trouble doing these things. So can you see my slides? Um, OK. Um, <clears throat> OK, well, thank you very much. And, and thank you. I appreciate this opportunity um, to, to talk about uh, our, our recent research uh, for my group on using uh, molecular um, simulation uh, to, to study systems of ionic liquids and hypothetic solvents um, inside nanopores for gas separation. Okay. I, I am a, in the Department of Chemical Engineering here at Northeastern. And, and so let me start uh, this presentation by acknowledging um, former, um, let me put this pointer here, yeah, acknowledging former and current group members. Um, so, so the students um, who are the most important part, and, 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 and me actually who, who did all the research uh, that we have published over there. The, the years, right? So these are pictures of, uh, of my group over the past few years. Um, so a total of 12 uh, grad students, in, 
among masters and PhD students have uh, graduated from my group. Um, and, and so one, one thing that I wanted to mention here is, uh, is about the co program that, that Emily mentioned a, a bunch of things about this uh, co program. For example, here, um, since I joined Northeastern back in 16, three of my group members have, have done or we do co ops. Okay? So, for example, this is a, a by Carra. She did a co op in, in No Artist. She's a, she was a PhD student in my group, recently graduated. And, and uh, this is Andres Bodopivet. He did a, a co op at um, Bristol Myers Squibb. And, and, uh, and, and so he, the, most of the, the work I'm going to present today is uh, from, from this gentleman over here, Jamin Shu. Uh, he's a current PhD student in my group. Uh, he's, he's going to do a co-op in Moderna, hopefully, uh, if everything goes uh, all right. And, and so one, one thing I also wanted to mention is that, uh, well, Jamin is from China, uh, Andres uh, is from Ecuador. Okay, so, so being an international student, uh, I mean, it's possible to do uh, co-ops, uh, get secure co-op positions with the industry as part of our program. Vai is a, is a US citizen, so, so she didn't have any problems with, you know, any, any issues with visa or anything like that. Uh, so, so in the case of um, Andres and, 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 and Yamin, well, they have to, so they, they are here on the student's visa, so they have to get a, a, a CPT or an OPT. So these are things that are doable. So it's not, it's, a, it's an extra order, but it's doable. So these are just say one thing to mention here. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, funding sources. So all the funding agencies that have, we have that have funded re our research over the past few years. Um, and also want to, to acknowledge uh, super computing time from, from Northeastern University Research Computing. Okay, so they, they are the ones who provided all the, all the super computing time that we need to run our simulations. And also I, before joining Northeastern, I was at, LA, I was at LSU. And, and you know we also use resources from from LSU to run our simulations. Okay. Um, well, I, I said that um, what we do in our group is a uh, molecular simulations, specifically molecular dynamic simulations. So in principle, these uh, molecular simulations are just exp an experiment on a computer. Okay. So in these uh, in these uh, simulations, we we model the classical mechanics of atoms in molecules. Okay, so at the end of the day, what we are doing here is uh, uh, solving Newton's equation of motion for every atom present in our system. So, so we, uh, we have the force equal to mass times acceleration. The acceleration, as you know, is the second derivative of position with respect to time. <clears throat> and the forces uh, we, can, we can calculate by looking at all the energy interactions that an atom I experiences due, due to the other atoms present in the system, okay? And so by modeling the motion of atoms and molecules in, in, in our systems, we can get um, atomic insights into structure and dynamics of atoms in our systems, okay? So, so I always like to make the analogy that these uh, molecular dynamic simulations are effectively a molecular microscope. We can understand what the behavior of matter at the molecular level of detail. And I want to note that it's a very difficult or also very expensive to get a, a similar information using just experiments. So you need a powerful technique such as X-ray diffraction, NMR, and so on. And, and, and so these techniques may work for some systems, but may not work for other particular systems. Okay, and, and so these uh, molecular dynamic simulations can be used, for example, to assist in the interpretation of experimental results. Okay, so, so oftentimes uh, uh, an experimentalist, they have approached my group, and so they have told me, well, you know, we have uh, this series of experimental results. We believe the experiments are correct, but the, the, the results are puzzling, so we don't know what is going on. And in principle, we can model these things in the computer and um, for example, understand um, how, so for example, this, uh, this snapshot over here is a, is a molecular dynamic simulation of an ionic liquid that we are going to describe in a few minutes inside a nanopore, right? So the nanopore walls are these uh, gray bits over here. And so from the simulation, for example, you can get idea of how the different ions are arranging themselves around the, the four walls that may 
lead some, some crazy experimental results. And also you can get ideas of, of the mobilities of all the different um, ions in our systems. For example, here in these uh, snapshots, the, 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 the ions are color coded according to their speed. So the blue is uh, ions that move very slowly inside the, the nanopores and, and red are molecules that move faster that are outside the nanopores or, or outside or in nanopores that are of larger size. Okay, so by, by, by using these uh, molecular microscope capabilities, uh, you can make sense and, and, and help explain uh, possible experimental results. You can also understand molecular behavior. So you can also explore conditions that may not be accessible by experiments. For example, you can increase the pressure in this system to a very high value beyond what you can study with experiments. And, and so with experiments, you will need a sophisticated equipment so that to make sure that we can access a very high pressures. Okay, so, so then uh, in a sense, uh, these molecular simulations can, can complement and can even guide experiments in some situations. And, and so we, we said that, well, we, we run simulations of these ionic liquids inside nanoporous materials, but well, let me tell you a little bit of what ionic liquids are. So the, the textbook definition of ionic liquids is that these are organic salts <clears throat> and with a melting temperature below the boiling point of water. And so these, uh, these uh, ionic liquids are formed by combining a, a cation that is typically organic and has, this, uh, has a, a complex, if you will, molecular structure. Combine that, that cation with, a, with an anion that also has a, a, a kind of complex uh, molecular structure. Uh, uh, so what happens with these uh, uh, ions is that they don't pack very well in the solid state. So compare against, uh, for example, sodium chloride, sodium and chloride are just spheres of different sizes. So they pack very well, very easily. And so the, the end result is that you have to increase the temperature to very high temperatures, 800 degrees C, to melt uh, the sodium chloride. These ionic liquids, uh, you just need to increase the temperature a little bit and they are going to be liquids okay, to melt it. And so most of, a lot of these ionic liquids are, are liquids at room temperature. And so some of them, we call them room temperature ionic liquids. And, and so these ionic liquids have attracted a lot of attention since maybe 20 years ago. And basically because uh, they have a very highly tunable properties up to different, up to 10 to the 18 different ionic liquids you can obtain by, by altering the molecular structure of the cation or the anion. Okay? And, and in principle, you know, these, uh, these ionic liquids have attracted a lot of attention as designer solvents for chemical synthesis, uh, catalysis, and separations also attracted uh, um, uh, attention, for example, as electrolytes for, for photovoltaics and electrochemistry. And in fact, that, that was uh, our original motivation in our original studies. Okay, so, so we wanted to study the properties of ionic liquids inside nanoporous materials because uh, um, you know, back uh, some, some 16 years ago, people were interested in, in, in using these ionic liquids as, electro, as new electrolytes for double layer capacitors, which have a devices that have a structure similar to a battery. Okay, so have a, a cathode and an anode. The difference is that the, 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 there, are no, there are no chemical reactions in these double layer capacitors. But um, you know, the, the thing is that uh, these capacitors can provide uh, uh, important chunks of energy very quickly. And so they can be used to complement batteries and, and fuel cells in many different applications. And so over the, the, over the years, we model, we use these uh, classical molecular dynamic simulations to model different ionic liquids inside porous materials of different geometries, for example, carbon nanotubes, slip pores, made of graphite or titanium. And here we have a ion, ion liquid inside uh, this CNK order mesoporous carbon. So these are basically cylinders made of carbon arranged in hexagonal array. And you have the, nano, the, the ionic liquid in, in the middle of them. And, and you have uh, these uh, carbons of dissolved four morphologies and the ionic liquid inside them. Okay, so, so that was the work of, of a bunch of, uh, of a postdoc and three grad students in my group that have uh, resulted in, in, in publications over the, the last uh, years. Um, so more recently, our, our, our interest in, in 
focus also in on diprotetic solids, which are similar to a uniliquid. In the sense of uh, uh, uniliquids, as I said, are, are formed by one cation and one anion. Uh, a diprotetic solvent, you have a, a hydrogen bond acceptor, which in this case, uh, for example, is, a, is an ion pair, is choline, that is a cation, and chloride, which is a, an, an ion, right? So this, this ion pair forms this hydrogen bond, bond acceptor. And you mix that with a hydrogen bond donor, for example, ethylene glycol, in a proper ratio, one mole of choline chloride, two moles of ethylene glycol. And, and, and so what happens when you mix them is that they form what we call an enthetic mixture, okay? So the mixture has a melting point that is much lower compared to the melting point of the original components, okay? And, and, and so, <clears throat> so what happens with, and, and so typically these diprotetic solvents tend to be liquids at room temperature. And so these uh, diprotetic solvents attracted a lot of attention also because they are analogs to ionic liquids. They have similar physicochemical properties. However, they are much, much cheaper to, than ionic liquids. Uh, some ionic liquids can be very expensive, okay? And th these uh, diprotetic solvents are very easy to prepare. And uh, uh, most of them are non-toxic and, and biodegradable. And, and, and so they attracted uh, some applications in metal processing, chemical synthesis, and, and electrochemistry. But recently, they also attracted uh, uh, attention on separations of, of gas separations, in particular CO2 separations. And so that motivated our, our work. So we wanted to fundamentally understand nano-confined uh, diprotetic solvents inside, uh, so inside pores for CO2 separations. Uh, as you may know, um, um, uh, the, the current state of the art to, to remove CO2 from, from gas streams, flue gas, for example, is a, a, a absorption using aqueous amine solutions. Okay, so here you have amines, amine mixed with water that reacts with the CO2, cleans the gas. So here you got, uh, for example, flue gas or methane, gas, natural gas, without any, with, with trace amounts of CO2. Then here you have a, the, what we call the rich amine that is a concentrated with CO2. And so then a, in the disorber, we, we heat up the amine with, with, I mean, with, in a reboiler, for example, with steam. And then a, here we separate the CO2 for, you know, you can use the CO2 or you can sequester the CO2. And then the, the, what we call the lean amine, that is the, the amine with, with less CO2, is a recirculated to absorb. Okay, so, so these, uh, these separations are, they work very well, uh, but um, the problem here is that you need a, a huge amount of energies to regenerate the, sol the, 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 absor the solvent in the disorder. So you remember that these are aqueous amine solutions. To boil water, you need a lot of energy. Okay? And so then uh, you need a lot of energy to run this disorder. <clears throat> and so people have suggested to use uh, ionic liquids and hypothetic solvents for these uh, type of separations, and people have tried to, to, to develop these uh, novel formulations for these uh, applications. However, most of them are, are, have problems because uh, they have a uh, mass transfer limitations. A lot of these ionic liquids and hypothetic solvents tend to be very dense and very viscous. And, and so then uh, uh, they have a uh, mass transfer limitations. Um, and, and also some ionic liquids tend to be very expensive. Here to run these, uh, these columns, you need uh, gallons and gallons uh, uh, of, of, of solvent. And, and so that may not work if you have a very expensive ionic liquid. One way around this uh, problem is to immobilize these ionic liquids or DSs inside membranes, for example, with micron-sized pores or inside nanometer-sized pores and form these uh, supported membranes or supported phases. And so in that sense, uh, well, you have a less amount of ionic liquid or DS inside the nanopores. And um, well, if you make the, the membranes the right way, in principle, the mass transfer limitations, you can overcome them. Okay. And, and so we wanted to fundamentally understand um, different systems of DESs uh, for separation, for this type of separation. And so, so this is a work of, of, of three P, uh, PhD students from my group, uh, Jan, Rubayet, and they, they graduated already, and Yami, who is uh, next, is close to graduation. So they perform molecular dynamic simulation of, of, of these uh, diprotetic solvents inside slit, rutile, or graphite pores, okay? 
So to separate a, a gas mixture of CO2 and methane, that is a 5% CO2, 95% methane, and these are pressures, these are high pressures, but the, the pressures that you typically find in industry, um, uh, uh, for, for example, to clean natural gas out of CO2. Um, so we, we study different formulations of this DES polyethylene, which is formed by, by mixing choline chloride, uh, choline and chloride with ethylene glycol uh, at different molar ratios. So you have a, a one, two, so two moles of ethylene glycol, or four moles of ethylene glycol, or eight moles of ethylene glycol for every mole of choline chloride. Okay. Um, and, and so, um, well, we, we, we mobilize those inside slip force, so rectangular force uh, uh, of size uh, 2.5 nanometers or 5 nanometers, can be made of graphite carbon or, or titanium, rutile, rutile titanium, and also in the bone. Okay, so here you have a, our hypothetic solvent, and here you have the gas reservoirs at both sides here and also here, right? Uh, so in these snapshots that you will see, typically I color ethylene glycol in blue, choline in, in green that you can barely see in here, and, and well, chloride is a, it's a small sphere that is orange that, well, is there, but you cannot see them very well, okay? But it's there. So we, we use this software uh, uh, called Gromax to, to run our MD simulations. And, uh, and so here are details of the, of the models, uh, uh, the force fields, or the models that we use to account for the interactions between different atoms in our system. Okay, so, so all of these uh, models, we, we, we calibrated that. And, and so that is a, another important thing. We typically try to calibrate our models, make sure that they are correct. Okay, and, and so we were able to typically run simulations and uh, uh, compare the simulation results against experimental measurements of CO2, uh, of diffusivity of CO2 inside these uh, DESs, and also another variable for selectivity that we're going to, to talk about in a few minutes in bulk uh, one to ethylene. And so our simulations were able to reproduce experimental results for this particular system. And now that we, we know that the simulations are correct, well, now we can use the simulations to um, study systems that have not been studied experimentally. Okay? And, and so the, our simulations are explaining these uh, papers. Most of the work I'm going to show today is, uh, most of the results I'm going to show today are for are by determined by, by Jan and Xu okay? in this uh, recent paper, but um, uh, Jan and Ruba yet uh, published a, a few papers over the last few years okay? uh, on related work. So, so one of the variables that we measure, for example, is, is, is this variable called solubility selectivity, okay? which measures the separation capability based on gas absorption. Okay? And, and so this uh, solubility selectivity is calculated at this ratio of mole fractions, so for CO2, and, and this one in the denominator, you have the ratio of mole fractions for metal. So, so here you have a Y, that is the mole, fa mole fraction of CO2 or methane in the bulk gas phase. So, so basically in these uh, regions marking in, in orange in here, and uh, X in this equation represents the mole fraction of CO2 or methane inside the pore. Okay? The pore is filled with the DES in here. Okay? And, and, and so, so here I'm showing the, the solubility selectivity results as a function of the different uh, systems. So, so G stands for graphite pore, R, R stands for rutile pore or titanium pores, and, and so this is graphite pore of two nanometers, rutile pore of two nanometers, graphite pore five nanometers, graph, uh, rutile pore of five nanometers, and this is the ball, and uh, the DS in the ball. And so you have uh, three different bars. So the dotted bar is for uh, et, for ethylene at a molar ratio one two, so one mole of choline chloride, two moles of ethylene glycol, one four is the checkerboard, and one eight is the solid core. Okay. So our results indicate that, uh, well, the, the best solubility selectivity among our system is obtained for, for one to ethylene in, inside a five nanometer graphite pore, followed closely by, you know, the same DES inside a two nanometer graphite pore. Okay. And, and, and so the, these results are explained that in that paper that we published recently, but um, so we, we, we also take, took a, a more detailed look at the results and, and so, our results indicate that, for example, the solubility selectivity inside the pores 
decrease as we increase the ethylene, the, the ratio of ethylene glycol in our system when they are inside the pores. In the bulk, they don't seem to behave the same way. It seems to, the results seem to indicate that as you increase the ratio of ethylene glycol, the, well, the, the, the solubility selectivity increases. Okay, so you see different behavior in the bulk as compared to in the inside the nanopores. Okay, and, and the other thing is that the solubility selectivity tends to be larger in a, a graphite pores as opposed to, to rutile pores. Another measure of separation is, a, is, is this a diffusivity or transport selectivity, okay? which measures separation capability based on gas diffusivities through the DES. Okay? And so basically what we're doing here is comparing the diffusivities of CO2 and divided by the diffusivity of methane inside the DES. Okay? And, and, and so, so again, this is the diffusivity selectivity for the different systems Okay, and different ethylene formulations, our results indicate that the best, so be, the best diffusivity selectivity was obtained for the, the bulk diprotetic solvent one to eight mole ratio, or in the same, the same molar ratio, one eight, but inside a two nanometer root type. Okay? So one thing to, to keep in mind here is that, well, the, the, diffusivity, the diffusivity selectivity tend to be very low on the order of 1.5, so, so then, well, CO2 and methane have, in a sense, have similar mobilities inside these uh, systems. Uh, and this is something that, that you would prefer to be a larger value. You would prefer that CO2 has a, a selective, uh, has a diffusivity that is uh, maybe uh, uh, five or 10 times larger than the value that you see for, for methane. Okay. Also, the other thing to remember is uh, that, well, the, 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 the mobilities, the gas mobilities tend to be smaller when the systems are inside narrower pores. Okay. And so that also is another thing to keep in mind. Um, the last, the final metric of, of separations is, uh, is this variable called sperm selectivity that calculates, that is the ratio of permeability. Okay. Uh, uh, so permeability, you can see that as a combination of, of absorption. And, and, and transport separation capabilities. Okay, so you can calculate that as the product of the solubility selectivity times the diffusivity selectivity. And so again, this is the perm selectivity for the different pore systems and the different ethylene formulations and in the bulk. Okay, and so our results indicate that the best uh, perm selectivity is observed for this particular system that is a one to ethylene inside a five nanometer graphite pore. Um, so, so I, I'm not showing a lot of results in here, but uh, our analysis uh, uh, showed that, well, the perm selectivity is affected in, in a, in a non-trivial and complex way by, well, you know, changing the ethylene glycol ratio, the interactions between the DES and the gas and the DES and the pore walls. And so it's also affected by pore wall chemistry and the pore size. Okay. And, and so one, one thing to keep in mind in here is uh, that, well, the per selectivity in here is on the order of 20. Okay. The largest per selectivity in the bulk system is on the order of 14. Okay. So, so what this is telling you is that the confining this system inside nanometer size pores is. I mean, helps a little bit, but doesn't help dramatically. It doesn't increase the per selectivity in a dramatic way. Okay, so that uh, leads us to, to our conclusions. Okay, so we we perform these uh, MD simulations of these uh, uh, DES of different formulations of DES inside pores or in the bulk for separation of CO2 and methane. And, and, and so what we our main finding is that the per selectivity for this particular DES is not dramatically better than in the bulk. Okay? And, and so that suggests that, well, maybe we need to consider other porous matrices, okay? polymers or graphene oxides that, can, uh, uh, that may lead to better performance, much better performance in confined DESs compared to the bulk DES. And also, uh, well, considering a different diprotetic solid. Okay? So here we just consider one. Okay? Um, and just to, to finish, uh, 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 ionic liquids is not the only thing that we do in our group. Okay, so, so in our group, we do other things. Uh, so we also model these ionic liquids and diprotetic solvents. And um, so we do this, uh, what we call process simulation. So, so this is done 
with Aspen Plus that may, many of you may be familiar with, okay, to study, for example, absorption power or absorption refrigeration cycles, but also for CO2 removal. On, on the molecular simulation front, uh, uh, my group has been trying recently to, 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 to do more bio-related simulations as, as many of, the, of my collaborators are in, in my department. And, and so they tend to have uh, expertise in biomaterials and, and nanomedicine. For example, in this, uh, in this uh, world, we are modeling liposomes, which are you know, lip, nanometer spheres made of, of lipid nanoparticles, lipid, of lipid molecules. And, and so this technology is similar to what you have in your COVID vaccines, where, where these uh, lipids uh, encapsulate uh, uh, active, pharmaceut active pharmaceutical ingredients. Okay, and, and then you inject that in, in, in the body to deliver drugs to, 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 to certain parts of your body. Okay, and, and, and so then uh, the idea here is that these uh, liposomes, because they are very elastic, they can squeeze into fibrous tissue and deliver uh, uh, drugs uh, more effectively. Recently, we have been also trying to, to, to use molecular simulations to model phenomena happening, happening in, the, in the intestinal mucus barrier. Okay, for example, these are. Uh, my cells made of bio salts and, and, and all this uh, uh, wild like thing is, uh, is, is, the, is a model of intestinal mucus. Okay? Uh, so this is, for example, to try to, to understand what is happening in, in, in our digestive system and, and try to develop uh, drugs that are better absorbed by our, our digestive tract. Um, and, and also we have a, a model, the, the interfacial properties of these uh, small proteins called hydrophobins for, you know, for, for oil still uh, clean up, and, but also for processing of polymer. Okay, so, and, and so with that, I, I, I finish uh, my presentation. I, I thank you very much again for this opportunity, and I, I will be very happy to take any, any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Hung, for going through uh, this presentation on your research. Um, we do have the Q&A function enabled within the yeah. webinar. Uh, so if anybody does have any questions, please feel free at this time to uh, enter your questions into the Q&A feature, and we'll be happy to address them. Yeah, one thing that I, I also forgot to mention is that um, so most of the most of the work I show today is the work of a, of a PhD student in my group, uh, Yamin Shu. So he, he started in my group as a master's student. So so he so what he did is a uh, he so the first year he he took the classes right. Then the second year, the beginning of the second year, he joined my group, did a, a very quick thesis in just one year. Uh, then join my group as a PhD student and, and, and you know have been doing all the all the things that I show today and other things that I didn't show. And, and so he's very close to graduation, but he decided to take a, a co-position at, at, um, at Moderna, actually. Um, and yeah, just to, to, to learn more and, and you know see explore industry and you know. Awesome. It looks like uh, we have a couple questions uh, that have come through. Um, I can address part of the first question that um, pertains to funding of a master's degree. Um, funding for a master's degree is on the rare side. However, we do have other financial um, aid options at Northeastern, such as uh, Dean scholarships, uh, U.S. students can file for federal aid. Um, we do have on-campus jobs available. And then, of course, there is Northeastern's co-op program. And if students do opt to participate in a co-op, that is a paid co-op. So essentially a paid internship that would help to um, go towards funding a master's degree. Um, and regarding connecting uh, with the lecturer, um, you can always feel free to email us directly in admissions. Uh, I will put that actually in the chat function. I will put our uh, COE graduate admissions email. Um, we're happy to direct your questions in the right direction, especially pertaining to this webinar. I'm happy to connect you back uh, with Professor Hung or the chemical engineering department. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add, but I think the next question is definitely 
more geared towards uh, Professor Hong. So I'll let you go ahead and take that one. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So the question is um, uh, address possible oversaturation in the DES that can potentially affect per selectivity. And um, well, not, not, not sure I completely understand. Is uh, maybe this is oversaturation or, or, I mean, I don't really know oversaturation of what. But I guess uh, you know one, one thing that, that you can do in molecular simulations is that you can um, have, I mean, you, you're basically, I mean, you, you have a system that is completely well characterized, right? So you have, a, because it's a computer model, right? So, so you are mixing exactly one mole of choline chloride with, two mo with exactly two moles of uh, ethylene glycol. So there are no contaminants unless you want to put them in the new system and see what happens. And there is no, I mean, in, in, for example, in our case, there is no water, okay? We haven't considered the effect of water in our system, but you can add them. You can add those uh, in, in your system, provided that you have a, a, a good model for these contaminants, right? And so, so that, I, I guess that is a, one of the things of, of simulations, right? That, that well, you don't have a, you don't have uh, these uh, problems that, I mean, these problems in, in, in experiments, for example, you have been in experiments, you have to be, you have to be, in experiments, you have to be very careful with contamination, and oversaturation and other things. Yeah, I don't know if uh, that answers your question or maybe maybe the, the thing will be to, to understand oversaturation of what. All right. Looks like we have uh, one more. Um, I'm working on typing an answer to the last question regarding uh, the admissions process and funding, um, but I will go ahead and pass uh, the question uh, from Temelian to uh, Professor Hung. Uh, what are the, so the question is, uh, what are the necessary skills for a prospective st student to have before joining the research group? Okay. Uh, well, I, I, I can tell you that out of the 12 um, students that have graduated from my group, I mean, let, let me start by saying that, well, well you know, you have uh, these, these simulations and, and, well, I don't know anything about computers and, and you know, that can be intimidating. But one, one thing that I will tell you is that out of the 12 students have, that have uh, graduated from my group, I think only one knew had pre prior experience on, on, sim on computer simulations before joining my group. Okay, so, so basically we, we, you, you, learn, you learn all these things uh, uh, as you go. Okay, so you learn all these things uh, from, from, by interacting with my, my group members, my current group members. So, so they can train you in these things. Uh, also, also I, can, I can give you resources that can help you understand and, and, and um, understand and, and run the simulations, okay? So, so we do that all the time. Uh, I will tell you that, of course, uh, there is a, a, a bit of a, of, a, of a learning curve. So you need to, so in principle, we run the simulations in a, in a supercomputer because uh, these, these simulations are, are take, take a, a, so they are computationally very expensive. So we run that in a, in a parallel computer. So you need to, to understand, I mean, you need to know how to, connect to the supercomputers, uh, have the appropriate commands and run the particular uh, software. And so, but I mean, they, there's a little bit of learning in there, but it's dual. Okay? So a lot of people in my group have done that. And um, yeah, and, and well, uh, so programming skill is a, is, a, is a plus, but I mean, uh, as I said, a, a number of people that joined my group didn't, I mean, some of them don't, don't even know how to program. I mean, for example, Yami knows a lot of programming. He programs a lot of, in Python. But for example, Rubayet, Yang, eh, they didn't program too much, right? So, so they had limited programming skills. So, but they, they were able to do the things. Eh, eh, so they were able to grab the skills needed to, to in order to solve the problem. Okay, so. Thank you. And it looks like we have uh, one final question. Okay, so, yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, in principle, um, yeah, thank you very much for your interest in, in this, uh, uh, I mean, in these uh, many different projects. Uh, uh, so, so in principle, yes, I mean, uh, 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 we, we typically, 
I am, I am open to recruiting masters and, and, and PhD students depending, I mean, PhD students also, also depend, uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, open, open to recruiting masters and PhD students. Um, so currently, right, right now, I have a one master student uh, uh, working, starting to work in this uh, process, in this uh, intestinal mucus uh, uh, barrier system. Um, but of course, uh, you know, uh, I don't think one master student will solve the whole problem. Right? So, so I mean, we, my group is open to, to, to recruiting more master students in this particular area. Um, and, uh, about scholarships, uh, well, I think Emily respond, uh, rep uh, say a little bit about that. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, scholarship depend a, a, a lot uh, on, on many different things. Um, um, so I, I know there are, there are different sources uh, for, for I mean, some of, I, some of the master students I had uh, were self-funded, uh, but I know that there are some, some resources available, but you know, but I think, I think the, the Emily covers some of the, of the things available in there. And we yeah. can explore other, other funding sources if needed. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And just to touch again briefly um, on the scholarship question, we do have limited merit-based scholarships available, which are called our Dean Scholarships. Um, there's no separate application for those scholarships. If you do submit an application, every application is automatically considered for a Dean Scholarship. Again, those are merit-based. Um, and again, they are limited, uh, especially now that we are later on in the admission cycle. Um, but again, we do have other opportunities for um, financial financial aid that I mentioned earlier and in the chat as well, um, things like the co-op program and federal funding for U.S. students um, and also on-campus jobs available to help to offset that cost. Wonderful. Thank you again, everyone, uh, for attending today, for your participation. Are there any final questions before we say goodbye? All right, what I'm going to do quickly is just type our admissions email address in the chat. Um, so that will be, again, not in the Q&A function, but in the chat function, I've typed our uh, COE grad admissions email. Um, any questions pertaining to the application process, anything discussed today in this webinar, um, if we can't answer it on our admissions team, we're happy to pass you off to uh, the right person to answer your question, um, including Professor Hung, as well as the chemical engineering department. Um, so thank you so much again, Professor Hung, for the wonderful presentation today. Thank you all so much for your time and joining. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, answering any future questions that you have, and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone.